Hello, how are you? I'm Hector Perez. Welcome to this new .NET MAUI course, where you will learn to create three amazing applications in .NET MAUI from scratch. The first application we will create is a body mass index calculator. This is the calculator you can see on the screen, where you can enter a weight in kilograms. Following the instructions of the placeholders, we will also enter a height, for example, 180 centimeters. By clicking on the button that says calculate, you will see the result according to the data entered. In this case, it indicates that we are overweight. We are given a result. You will see that the application has some restrictions, such as we can only enter numbers in these text boxes. This is the first project we're going to develop. Having previewed the application we're about to build, it's time to start crafting it. To do this, we'll navigate to the Visual Studio IDE. Upon launching the IDE, you'll typically see this window where you can establish a new project. If you haven't installed Visual Studio or need guidance on how to do so, I'll include a YouTube tutorial as part of this lesson's resources, which outlines the entire IDE installation process. Initially, click on the button labeled Create a new project. This will display a list of various templates available in Visual Studio for creating diverse projects tailored to different environments, such as cloud-based, web-based projects, and so forth. In our scenario, we're looking for a MAUI app template. You can find this template by entering the term MAUI, and you'll see various project options or templates to choose from. We're particularly interested in creating a .NET MAUI app template. After selecting the template, click Next, and you'll be presented with a text box to rename the project. We can name it, for instance, BMI Demo. Leaving the other information as default, click Next, and finally Create. At the time you're watching this video, there might be a different version of the framework available, potentially a more recent one, but the overall environment remains the same. The files you need to alter or the XAML code you need to input remains unchanged. Click Create to initiate the project's creation, and once the project is established, you'll see a screen similar to the one currently displayed. As I mentioned, this screen may slightly differ depending on when you're reviewing this video. I'm going to close this tab, and you'll see that we have a solution that has been created which contains a project. We possess a project encompassing various folders, dependencies, and so on. The initial folder is intended for general configuration. There exists another folder named Platforms, where multiple subfolders have been established each targeting a distinct operating system. Within each of the folders, we possess some files that directly influence the platform on which we aim to deploy the application. For instance, we have some files that are quite distinctive of Android, such as the Android manifest and the main activity file. This is primarily for crafting something very specific for one of the platforms. We also have a folder named Resources, where we can find resources that will be utilized by the application on various platforms generally, like fonts, images, and some text or added files for instance. There's also a folder to configure the images for the splash screens and a style folder. The later has an extension .xaml, which essentially defines the appearance of what will be displayed to the user when we deploy an application. We possess some files such as app.saml, which is fundamentally the primary file of the application where we have SAML code and resources of the application are defined. This file is commonly employed to add different styles to the application, to create style dictionaries, and even to modify the colors of the application at runtime. For instance, we have a file named appshell, which is essentially a container where different pages will be added. This container will be responsible for presenting them to the user either in a site menu format or in a tab format, in a very simple manner. In this course, we won't be dealing with AppShell, as it is a completely different subject. We'll concentrate on the content pages. For example, in this instance, we have a content page named mainpage.xaml, 
which you can see displayed on the screen. If we visualize the XAML file, you'll notice that it has a structure similar to an XML format, where elements are defined via tags. This is the way XAML files operate, they define the graphical interface of an application. As part of the demonstration of this pre-built example, we have some containers, for instance, a container named scroll view. Its function is to scroll or slide the screen with your finger to view the content that's further down if it exceeds the screen. We also have something known as layouts that enable us to add elements to be displayed on the screen in a specific manner. For instance, this layout named Vertical Stack Layout allows us to stack elements vertically. We have some configurations of this layout here and within a layout you can add different controls. The names are quite self-explanatory. For example, we are adding an image here. We also add a label element and another label element. Each of these has different features that we'll be adjusting throughout these examples. Lastly, a control named button defines things like a click event, a name, text, and so on. If we execute this application that's been created by default, or to execute it, we can navigate to the top menu where it says Windows Machine by default. We select this drop down element. We specify that we want to run the application on an Android emulator. In this instance, I've already set up the emulator beforehand. If you're interested in learning how to create these emulators, you can find a more detailed video in this video's resources, which provides a step-by-step -step guide on how to install different emulators. I choose the emulator I previously set up. I'm going to press this button to launch the app in the emulator. It's currently compiling the app, the first one we've created, and taking the necessary steps to deploy the app in the emulator. You might have also noticed that we had several platforms listed. We could have chosen the iOS platform or the Windows platform, which would have initiated the respective process to deploy the app on each of these platforms. The initial compilation may take some time. You can see at the bottom that the compilation is still ongoing. So let's wait for a few seconds, maybe a few minutes, while the app's deployment is being processed. After a few seconds, we can see that the app has been successfully deployed. We have here the pre-built app, for instance, and you can see that we have a one-to-one -one correspondence, I might say, with the XAML code. First, we have the layout that contains the elements, which is a vertical stack layout. And you can see that each of the controls that are part of the graphical interface are also vertically stacked. Next, we have an image control, which is this character we see in the center of the app. Then a label control, which is this control that says hello world. We also have another label control that says welcome to .NET MAUI multi-platform app UI. And lastly, a button that says click me. Each of these elements are what's being deployed as part of the sample app. The next step is to customize this app so it includes the controls or content we want and need. Before moving forward, I'd like to introduce you an extension that's both incredibly fascinating and highly beneficial when working with XAML files in .NET MAUI. This extension lets us format the XAML code in a straightforward manner, simply by saving the file. For example, in this XAML file that I've previously developed, you'll notice that we have the XAML tags and the code isn't very neat. In this table control, there's a lot of space remaining after I deliberately created a separation. This code isn't very neat, so ideally it should be formatted. However, doing this manually is time consuming, hence not very practical. What we're going to do is navigate to the Visual Studio menu and in the section labeled Extensions, select Manage Extensions. Once this tool is open, we can search for the term XAML. You'll find an extension named XAML Styler for Visual Studio 2022, which is the one displayed on the screen. 
all you need to do is install this extension. In my case, it already shows up with a green icon because it's already installed. Upon installing the extension, you'll need to reboot the IDE, closing all the active instances of Visual Studio at that time. When you shut down the IDE, the extension's installation process will kick off. You'll need to wait to make the modification. Click on Modify, and when you restart Visual Studio, this extension will already be enabled. So, with this step completed, you can open any file and press the key combination Ctrl plus S. Watch what happens. Automatically, the XAML code has been formatted in a neat, simple and quick manner. It even sorts the properties in alphabetical order. This is an excellent extension that I recommend installing whenever you're planning to work with .NET MAUI. It's the extension I'm using as part of the tutorials in these cars. The long-awaited moment has come to start, creating our first application in .NET MAUI. Firstly, we will remove all the predefined code that we saw earlier in a previous lesson. To do this, we will navigate to this file that I have open. If you don't have it open, it's the main page.xaml file. In this file, we will delete all the current content. That is, I'm going to delete all the content, this entire scroll view. You can simplify the visual structure by clicking on one of these icons. These icons collapse and expand all the XAML code. You can collapse the scroll view code, which is the primary container of this current content page. This allows you to easily delete all the content. Let's save the changes. Notice that if I save the changes using Ctrl plus S, this tag automatically closes. This happens because no content has been detected as part of the content page. I'm going to press Ctrl Z to undo the changes. If you want to save the changes without formatting, you just have to click on the button that says save or save all the changes. In this way, the changes are saved, but the formatting that we saw earlier is not applied. The next step we're going to take if you were to try to run the application at this time if we look at the bottom, we have here a list of errors. These errors indicate that the element called counter btn does not exist in the current context. What does this refer to? Well, we removed the button that we previously had as part of the example. I'm going to undo this code, or I'm going to show the code that we previously had, and it's this button that we previously had called counter btn. This is what this error you can see on the screen refers to. Why is this error appearing? Well, the error is appearing because in a file called the code behind or the code behind the XAML file, we are using or trying to use a control with this name. I'm going to remove the scroll view once more. To see this code behind, we'll navigate to the solution explorer. We notice a file named mainpage.xaml and to its left, there's a triangle. By clicking on it, we unfold the files that are linked to mainpage.xaml. In this instance, we have a linked file named mainpage.xaml.cs, which is a file containing C-sharp code. By clicking or double-clicking on this file, it automatically opens up the C-sharp code for us to run or alter how the application functions. You'll notice that within the file, we have something referred to as an event handler, on counter clicked. This is a C-sharp concept about event handlers. What's being attempted here is the assignment of a text to the counter BTM text property. However, since we've removed this button from the visual interface, we now have three identical errors. This is because the counter BTN reference is being attempted to be used in three different locations. To rectify this issue, we'll simply remove the event handler to maintain clean code and also eliminate this int count to avoid having pre-written code. In doing so, we've cleaned the solution. We've tightened up the project and we're now ready to begin adding our own code. After deleting the default code that was generated with the template, we'll begin crafting our application code. I'm going to demonstrate what the application looks like at this point. 
You'll notice that we have a blank screen, it doesn't contain any element. However, there is a top section where the text that reads HUM is visible. You might be curious as to why this navigation section is present when we haven't actually defined anything on the content page. This occurring because we're about to open the Solution Explorer. There's a file named app.saml, which is accompanied by another file called app.saml.cs. This page contains the essential code to initiate the application and we're implementing a configuration or specification of what the home page of the application will be. In this instance, we're specifying that the home page of the application will be a new instance of a file named app shell, which is the file we discussed earlier. I'm going to open the app shell file so you can briefly understand what it's about and what we're specifying on this SAML page. Remember that I mentioned earlier that you could define all the pages of your application here and this container will automatically display them to the user. Here, we're specifying what's the content for this container will be. In this case, we're specifying that it will be an instance of the main page, which is the content page. Also, as part of the explorer is the content page named main page that is included in AppShell. What we're doing here, what this container does, is display that top navigation section that you saw in the emulator. If we wanted to use only the page without that navigation container, we could do so by going to the app.saml.cs file. Instead of specifying that we want a new instance of the page container, we want just the page, that is, the main page, which is a page type file. Here we have this reference. We don't have issues because this property accepts an instance or a page type. Main page and app shell inherit from this base class called page, so we don't have any problem assigning the main page to the application's main page. Once we've done this, we're going to start the application to see how it appears. Perfect, you can see that at the top, we no longer have that navigation menu that we had before, so we are ready to proceed. Now it's time to discuss a tool called Hot Reload, which is very useful when we're creating graphical interfaces. This tool helps us to create elements as part of the content pages, as part of the files in which we define the application controls, and to be able to visualize these controls in an almost immediate way. For instance, I'm going to open the emulator here and suppose we want to add a button with a text that says hello. I close this tag, save the changes, and look as part of the application, this button has already been added instantly with the text that we have indicated. For instance, if we alter the font size property, which is the size of the font, to a value of 50, we save the changes and see how this change has been applied immediately to better view this label. This is Hot Reload, a very useful tool when working with XAML files. As part of the application, we don't want just a simple button control. We need a container that can hold more controls, because a graphical interface contains multiple controls, not just a button. For this, we will use a container or layout. It is important to remember that a layout can hold different controls. In this case, we will use a layout called Vertical Stack Layout. This allows us to align the elements in a vertical format automatically. For example, we're going to add a first button that says button in its text. Then we will create or copy this line several more times. After saving the changes, you will have the vertical stack layout with the three buttons we have defined. However, these controls appear at the top. Ideally, it would be better to center them to have a little more space and to improve the display of these elements. How can we center these buttons? Since the buttons are within a vertical stack layout, it would be ideal to center the vertical stack layout that contains the buttons. To do this, we can modify a property of the vertical stack layout called vertical options. The vertical options property allows us to play with the vertical options of the layout or the control we are working with. 
There is also another property called horizontal options, in case you wanted to work with the properties in their horizontal format. There are several values that we can use. In our case, we are interested in centering the elements. With this change, you can see that we are successfully centering the vertical stack layout. The next step is to alter the background because, personally, I find the white background not very appealing. We can achieve this by tweaking the property of the content page directly named background color. Let's begin by typing background. We have a few properties here. The one we should utilize is background color. We're going to employ the hash symbol to denote that it's a color followed by the digits 181818. If we save the changes now, I prefer the background color much more than the prior white shade. After we have adjusted this background, we must recall that the application, the one we viewed in the initial demo, didn't merely have buttons, it contained other controls. We're going to start altering the elements within the vertical stack layout to make them more akin to the final application. The first thing we're going to do is add the name of the application through a label control. So we're going to remove this button element and instead we're going to type label, which is a control that will enable us to write only text in the application to display it to the user. We have some properties such as the text property that allows us to specify what the text is that we're going to display to the user. In this case, it will be BMI calculator. I'm going to close this tag, save the changes, and you can observe that the control that we specified earlier is not very visible. If I zoom in, we will be able to see it, but it lacks good contrast. We're going to adjust some additional properties then, for instance, the text color. Let's state that the color will be equal to C, 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 C. I save the changes and with this, we can now see this label control better. We need to adjust the properties further to make this title more interesting. Let's specify that we want to align the title in the center of all the available space. Notice that if we begin to type horizontal, we get two options one named horizontal options and another horizontal text alignment. The former allows us to shift the entire control to the center, while the latter lets us maintain the same space for the control but only move the text within the control label. We will utilize the horizontal text alignment property. Let's specify that it will have a horizontal position. With this, we have centered the title. Let's enlarge the control or the label text a bit. We can do this via the font size property. Let's specify that we want a value of 30. Okay, it looks better. We will also state that we want to alter the font attributes to have a more defined text through font attribute set to bold. With this, we have successfully created the application's title. The next step is to create those text boxes that will enable us to input information into the application. For this, we will modify the second button and instead use a control called entry, which allows us to input information into the application. You can already see that a box. Well, an underlined line appears in which we can input text once it is selected. Here, we begin to type text and again, this text box has some default settings that we need to adjust so that the application matches or better complements the colors of our application. Let's go back to the XAML code. We aim to set the background color to 2A, 2A, 2A. This enhances the look of the entry control space. This control lets us specify a text to suggest to the user what should be inputted. I'm talking about a property named placeholder that enables us to set this text. I will input, for instance, weight in kilograms. After saving the modifications, I go back to the emulator. You can observe that if I find entered text before, the placeholder doesn't show. However, if I delete all the text, the placeholder text weight in kilograms or any text we have set 
becomes visible. Another property we can adjust is the placeholder color. If we desire a different color, we can set the color as CCCCCC. I save the changes once more. We have now implemented the changes. Finally, I will change the text color. Currently, if I input any text, you can see that we have a black color. Let's alter the color to CCCCCC. In fact, the placeholder color will be set to 7D7C7C. There was a little mix up there, but after saving the modifications, we have the text. We also have the placeholder color. Notice how it appears as if the color brightens once we start entering text. We are progressing. This entry control is utilized for the user to input a person's white. The subsequent step involves creating the entry control, which enables the user to input a height. Given the similarity of the controls, we can duplicate the entry control. After leaving a new line, we paste the copied code. Upon saving these changes, you'll notice that the application has generated a second text box, another entry control for inputting a person's weight in kilograms. This replicability of XAML code serves as a significant advantage. If we were utilizing a visual designer, controlling all this would be somewhat more challenging. We're going now to modify the placeholder so it doesn't display this text, but instead shows height in meters, for instance, 180. After saving these alterations, we now have a pair of entry controls for data input. The following step involves creating a final text box where we'll display the result of the calculation we perform. Once more, we can duplicate the entry control line as it possesses the same properties. However, in this case, we'll change the placeholder to your BMI. After saving these changes, we now have three text boxes that will facilitate the execution of operations within the application. The final step is to add a control or rather modify this existing button that will initiate the processing procedure. We'll alter some properties here. For instance, we'll specify that we desire a background color for this property equivalent to 0078D4, which is this blue color that you can preview thanks to Visual Studio. We're going to alter the text that says calculate. And finally, set the text color to white. After saving these changes, we can see that the app now looks significantly better. We have now implemented all the controls needed for the calculations. However, there are still some aspects we can enhance. For example, we have an issue with spacing, as each control doesn't have any margin separating it from the edge of the app or the content page, making it look less attractive. To fix this, we will adjust a property called spacing in the vertical stack layout to separate the elements slightly. Let's go back to the vertical stack layout and alter the spacing property. Adding a value of 25, for instance, will provide a gap between each of the elements. To separate each control from the border edges, we will change the property called margin and assign a value of 10, for example. With this, you can see that we now have a margin as part of the vertical stack layout that separates each of the controls in the graphical interface. We have now finished creating the graphical interface. As a final point, you can modify each of the app's margins separately by specifying the value for each of the locations. For example, to modify the left part, which is the first value we can alter as part of this property, we can specify a value of 10. The second value is used to specify a top margin. We set it to zero. The third margin is used to specify a value on the right and the last value is used to modify the bottom margin. If we save the changes now, you can see that we have a margin applied only to the left, while there is no margin applied to the right, top and bottom. 
If we want to modify only the left and right ends, we can leave a value of 10 and handle only a pair of values. The first value is used to modify the left and right margins, while the second value is used to modify the top and bottom values. In my case, I will leave a value of 10 that modifies all the margins on all sides. With this, we have completed the creation of the graphical interface of our body mass index calculator. Once we've completed the creation of the graphical interface, we'll incorporate interactivity into the app to carry out the relevant calculations. The initial step is to establish some sort of mechanism so that when we click this button, the calculation process starts in order to get the final body mass index result. How do we achieve this? Well, within the button control, we have what's known as an event. An event is used to trigger an action when another action is performed on one of the controls in the graphical interface. In this instance, we have an event called clicked. These events can be identified by their flash-like symbol on the left side. Each of these symbols represents something in one of the objects. For instance, this tool-like icon is actually a property in C-sharp code. Each of the controls has different events. Take the control called entry for example. If we search for the events, we have an event known as, for instance, text changed. You can see the event here. These kinds of events will come in handy when we modify the text as part of this entry control. You can see that each of the controls has events centered around what the control does. In this case, like the button for example, it doesn't have the capability to accept text. It doesn't have the event called text changed, but it does have the event called clicked that we can create. How do we create it? Well, we're going to type this pair of quotes again. You can see that the name of the event was automatically filled in. If it wasn't, you can press the control and space keys and it will display the option for you to create a new event handler. In my case, it has already been created. We can observe it here. We can assign it by choosing it. Once we've accomplished this, you'll notice that a line has emerged beneath this event. What occurs is that when c -sharp code is established in one of the application files, that modification needs to be applied more directly to the application or by restarting the application. In this instance, we have a feature named Hot Reload. This is the function of this button that we observe at the top. If we click on this icon, you will notice that the error has vanished. What has happened here is that the application has been recompiled internally, so we can observe the modifications made from the C-sharp code in the application or in the emulator while the application is in operation. We don't need to stop the application, execute a recompilation to reapply or observe those modifications we've made. In this manner, we're indicating that we wish to incorporate the changes in the C-sharp code as part of the preview in the emulator. So, you can observe that in the code behind, that is, in the main page.xaml.cs file, this new method named button clicked has been established. It corresponds to the name that has been established in the XAML file. What it is executing, or what this event handler will execute, because that's its name, is that when we press this button, it will execute what we define here. Now, one of the aspects that interest us is to obtain information from the graphical interface. For instance, from these entry controls. The user is going to input information and we, in this code behind, decide to obtain that information to process the data that the user inputs and perform the necessary calculation. How can we access these controls from the graphical interface? Well, by assigning a name to each of the controls. For instance, I'll discuss this entry that has this placeholder. To name one of the controls, we need to do it through x colon name. We're going to assign a name, which can be any name you prefer. Let's say wait. I'm going to save the changes and return to the code behind. This way, if we try to access this field, you'll notice that it's already available from the code behind. 
We can access this control through the name we assigned in the XAML file. With this, we can access all the properties that are part of this control. Specifically, we are interested in accessing the text property, which stores the user's input text. Indeed, our aim is to get this value. Therefore, we need to store this value in another variable, so we can reuse it in a later step. We could use the control directly, but I prefer to store the value in a variable. We're going to declare a variable called weight, which equals to... If we try to make this conversion directly, that is, assign the value of the text box to the variable we've created, you'll notice that it's inferred that the data type is of the string type, as a text box accepts any character type. We aim to convert this text, this string, into a numeric value so we can work with numbers for the relevant calculation. Therefore, we're going to specify that we want to convert to a double data type using the parse method, which is precisely used to extract a value, in this case, double from a string. After doing this, notice that when we hover over var, the inference is made that the data type is a double data type, not a string data type. Let's verify that it is working correctly. I'm going to add a breakpoint. I'm going to apply these changes. In this instance, a recompilation had to be executed, as the changes could not be applied directly. I'm going to input some dummy data here. I'm going to hit the calculate button. And you can see that this is already throwing in a weight variable or the value 90 is being stored, which was the data we input in the graphical user interface. With this, we have been able to fetch data from the XAML file. I'm going to navigate back to the XAML file and this is because I'm going to add a X name also to the second entry control, which is the control to accept a person's height. I'm going to name it height. And while I'm in the file, I'm also going to name the third entry, which is called BMI. This way, I can access each of the controls from the code behind. Now that we have assigned a name for each of the controls, I return to the code behind and I'm going to now retrieve the height of a person through bar height equal to double dot parse. I'm going to pass the reference of the text property of the text box named height. In this case, since I'm interested in performing a conversion from centimeters to meters, as it is the formula that I currently have prepared to perform the calculation, we're going to execute a division over 100. And once we already have the data of the height and weight, I'm going to declare a new variable named IMC, which is equal to the weight over the height squared, which is this formula that you can see on the screen, with which we would obtain the result in a double format to show the user what the result has been. Next, we're going to assign BMI, which is the control in the XAML file will set its text property to be equal to the toString method of IMC. This means if we launch the application and input the data, then hit calculate, you'll notice that the result now appears in the third text box. This has been defined by the string format we've used in the toString method. We're using the toString method because IMC is a double data type and if we tried to assign this value directly to the text box, since text property is a string type property, we would encounter issues. We need to convert it to a string, and by using this string format, we're specifying that we only want two decimal places in the result. Now, this number that we've derived from this calculation might not be very familiar to you. Even I, who created the application previously, don't recall the exact values to determine if a person is overweight or at their ideal weight. We need to translate this value or present the user with a more descriptive result based on the calculation made. How we will do this? Well, my plan is to declare a set of constants within this class through which we can apply only a const double, 
will name it underweight threshold and set it equal to 18.5. In other words, we're creating a set of constants that will serve as the thresholds to determine the result that we should display to the user. I'm going to create a second constant called normal weight threshold and set it equal to 24.9. These are the official values. I'm also going to create one final constant, another double named overweight threshold equal to 29.9. These constants will come in handy when dealing with the value derived from the body mass index and providing the user with a more descriptive string. Once we have these constants set up, I'm going to create a new method after the event handler. This method will return a string and will be named getBMIResultMessage, which will take in the value that was previously calculated. Here, as part of the calculation, I will verify if the BMI is less than underweight threshold. If it is, I will return a string that says you are underweight. If the BMI is less than or equal to normal weight threshold, which is the second threshold, I will return your weight is normal. Next, I will create another else if where the BMI is less than or equal to overweight threshold. In this case, we return the string you are overweight. Lastly, through an else statement, we will return the final string which will be you are obese, take care of yourself. With this, we've completed this method. We've already received a value which is the BMI and we return a descriptive string to the user. Now, how can we display this string? Well, after performing the calculation and assigning the BMI value to the BMI text box, we denote that the result string is equal to get BMI result message. In other words, we call the method we just created by passing it the BMI. Lastly, we're going to use a method called display alert, which is accessible to us due to the fact that we're on a content page like the one we see on the screen. This method will allow us to show the user some sort of notification or alert, and we'll see how it functions. We have to input, firstly, the title of this message, secondly, the message that we will display to the user, and thirdly, the string that we will show as part of the button to remove the text message. Let's specify that the title is the result string. As content, we will display the string obtained in the method. And finally, let's put a simple message like OK to remove this alert. I'm going to remove this breakpoint. Let's launch the application to see how it appears, what we have accomplished. We already have the application here. We're going to input a weight, a height, we click on calculate, and you can see that we're successfully showing the user the result according to their body mass index calculation. In this case, with these values that we have input, the message is that the person is overweight. With this, we can perform various tests. For example, we can decrease this value. After pressing the button again, we received a different message this time because the values has been altered. This is how we've incorporated this aspect of interactivity and computational processing into our application. Once we've completed the calculation within the app, there are still areas that could be improved. Currently, there are some issues that could cause the application to simply stop functioning. For instance, I'll go to the emulator to the app. I'm going to delete these values that we've previously inputted. If we click on the calculate button at this point, you'll notice an exception is thrown because we're trying to retrieve information from the text box and a satisfactory conversion can't be made. This is because this text box or this entry control doesn't contain information that we can convert into a double data type. We'll correct this issue. Before that, I'll show you another type of error that could occur within the app. Another error that can happen is that the user can input a text string into each of the entry controls. 
if we click on calculate with a gain encounter an exception because this string can't be converted into a double data type. The last point I want to show you is that the third text box or entry control, the one that says your BMI as a placeholder, currently we can alter its content and even though this doesn't directly impact the calculation part of the app, it shouldn't occur as the user shouldn't be able to input information into this text box. To fix this issue, we'll go to the XAML code and in the section where we've defined the entry controls, we'll change the keyboard type so the user can't input any text but can only input numbers. We can do this thanks to a property called keyboard. We have various values here that we could utilize. In our situation, we are focused on a numeric keyboard. I'm going to duplicate this attribute and insert it into the second entry control. To tackle this issue with the third entry control, where the user can input data, we're going to alter a property named is enabled. This gives us the ability to activate or deactivate the control. Our goal is to prevent the user from inputting data so we're assigning a false value to this entry control. I'm going to save the modifications, return to the emulator and observe that if I attempt to input data into the first text box at this time, the keyboard has already been altered. This adjustment ensures that we can only input a numeric value. The same applies to the second text box and the third text box has been locked to prevent the user from inputting data. In this manner, we have more control over what occurs in the application and we can prevent the user from encountering these types of exceptions, slightly controlling the information that can be input into the application. With this, we have completed our first application, the Body Mass Index Calculator.